I want you to think for a moment, what are the top five moments or experiences that you have been in awe of someone or something in your life? Anything come to mind? You know, these are, the, these are the moments, these are the times when everything else just seems to fade into the distance. Everything else just seems to freeze at that moment in comparison to this. It's almost, it's a time of wonder and amazement and great joy that's almost too great to even describe with words. What are those moments for you? Any come to mind in your life? You know, maybe it's taking in the beauty and magnificence of creation. Maybe being up on the top of a mountain peak, just looking out at this vast beauty and gorgeousness right in front of your eyes, just taking that in. Or or looking at this amazing ocean or a waterfall or a pure sandy beach, right? One of those scenes that the best digital camera, it can't touch it. It can't touch it. How about standing at a place of great historical significance? One of those places that you're just in awe of thinking at the people that stood on those very, the very dirt that you stood on, or the, the, what, that your eyes see, just being in awe of what took place in that very place. Or maybe at a more personal level, think of seeing or holding your child for the very first time. Man, I've had the privilege to be in awe at that moment several times in my life. And it's this, it's this crazy time that's filled with these emotions, this half crying, half laughing, half joyful, right? But it, it's instant love. That's the best way I can describe it. It is instant love at that very moment. Or guys, how about seeing your bride for the first time on your wedding day? adorned in that white dress at the, at the end of the aisle. I've, I've been there as a groom. I've been here as a pastor seeing that happen for others. And let me tell you, for that groom, there ain't nothing else going on in the world at that time for him. That's a moment of awe. Maybe it's holding your grandchild for the first time or witnessing a, a world-changing event, even like 9-11, right? You're watching it uh, play out before you, even on TV, or walking up those steps for the first time on a beautiful Sunday, sunny day at Wrigley Field. What could be more filled with awe than that? Do I have a few Cubs fans in here? Not many in here. Come on, online. There's got to be a few of you. Please, I hope. Those are big moments of awe in our lives. But what about Christmas? What about Christmas? I mean, I'm sure there's some aspects of just the Christmas season itself, right, that that ought to elicit a little bit of awe, right? Maybe it's that warm feeling you get that goes into making it the most wonderful time of the year. The lights, the decorations, right? Cutting down and putting up a a Christmas tree. Maybe that's some of your family tradition, right? Or or seeing that light, fluffy snow falling. If you like that, it's coming tomorrow, I think, (laughs) right? Or or maybe, maybe it's just sharing a meal, Exchanging gifts with those that you love while you sip hot apple cider next to the fire. I'm sure we enjoy those things, don't we? We can enjoy those things, those parts of Christmas. There's awe in that. But what about when it comes to the true meaning of Christmas? I mean, it's a, we, we've heard the Christmas story over and over, right? We, we go through it at this time of year, every year. We're going to do it again. And we've heard it, right? We've heard the baby Jesus being born in the stable, the angels, the shepherds, the wise men, the census, Joseph and Mary, right? We sing joy to the world and little drummer boy and angels we've heard on high like we just sung this morning. But in all of that, do we still miss the awe of what Christmas is all about simply because it's too familiar to us? It's too familiar You know, several years ago, the Senior PGA Golf Tournament came to our area for the first time. And there were people visiting our area that had never been here before. And I heard some comments. In fact, it might have been one of the golfers who was from another country because they come from all over the world, the golfers themselves. But as he looked out at Lake Michigan, he said, what is that ocean? Uh, Of course, us that are locals, right? We love the lake. We take walks by it. We take the kids down there and play. It's like we we love to do all that. But but we've become a little bit familiar with it, haven't we? Yeah, that's like Michigan. I don't think we see it in the same way that that golfer or somebody else who comes for the first time and they see that vast body of water. 
simply because we're familiar. And I wonder if that's how Christmas has gotten for some of us. We've heard the stories. We've heard it many times. But today, as we begin this new Christmas series, my hope, my prayer is that we would once again be filled with awe at what God has done in this season. We're going to take a step back today, and we're going to look at the theology of Christmas. Now, I just saw some of you just want to sleep. Please don't. Hang in there with me. This is exciting stuff, right? Incredibly exciting. I want us to be reminded once again of, uh, of why God the Father sent his son into the world. I want to look at the backstory of that. I want us to be in awe that the God of the universe at a point in time took on flesh and invaded our world. I want us to be reminded about the spiritual significance of that event back then and today. There's much to be in awe of at this Christmas season, and that's what I want us to look at. Take your Bible with me. Open up to Galatians chapter 4. Open your Bible app, whatever you've got. Those of you here with us in person, we have some Bibles in the seat in front of you. You might have to walk a little bit. They're spread out, but they're there for you. Before we can really grasp the awe of what Christmas is, of Christ coming to earth, we have to understand mankind's spiritual condition before Christ, meaning under the law. In fact, that's the context of what Paul describes in this letter in Galatians chapter 3. He describes that those who rely on the law are under a curse. That's verse 10. And, and no one is justified. No one's declared righteous before God by the law. That's verse 11. Instead of giving life, it imprisoned those under it. Look at verse 23. So vivid. Before this coming of this faith in Christ, we were held custody under the law, locked up. I mean, the vivid language. We're locked up in chains because the law, that's what it did, just imprisoned us under our sin. But that doesn't mean that the law was bad in and of itself. In fact, Paul says it was given, verse 19, because of transgressions. It was given to, to reveal our sinfulness, to show us our utter inability to, to keep all of the demands of the law and instead to point us to a Savior, right? That's the point of the law. In other words, it was temporary. Paul says it was a guardian who literally in Paul's day would have been a slave who is in charge of taking care of an, of an underage youth until they reached adulthood. And those guardians were often harsh, and so it caused those children to yearn to be set free from that guardian. And so until Christ came, we were like those dependent children who were under the, the harsh care of a slave. But now that Christ has come, we're no longer under the guardianship of the law which revealed and condemned and imprisoned us under sin. No, we are declared righteous through faith in Jesus. And because of that, we're full grown. We're children of God, right? We're part of his family. We are one in Christ despite our distinctions of race or ethnicity or age or sex, right? We're even heirs of God's promise that he made to Abraham before the law was given. That's verse 26 to 29. And Paul continues that theme as we head into chapter 4 of being brought from spiritual slavery to being adopted into God's family. And he starts with this before illustration to, to, to illustrate the bondage of our spiritual condition before salvation. Let's look at it. Galatians 4 verses 1 and 2. He said, Why I, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he's no different from a slave although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. And so what Paul describes here is practically speaking, a young child that's under, that's under guardians and trustees, that's in line to receive their inheritance uh, when their father is deceased, until that time, they're no different than a slave. They're no different than a slave I mean, he's legally the owner of the entire estate. It's all his legally. But he can't take possession of it. He can't, can't take control of it until he's come of age. He's too young. Again, guardians, they were slaves placed in charge of the care of underage boys. Trustees would have managed the property till they were old enough to be able to take possession of it themselves. So since the son, since the heir is underage, he's basically no different than a slave. 
because he's under authority of others until he reaches a time that's set by his father. Paul uses that illustration to say that such is the spiritual status of the Galatians and of every one of us before coming to faith in Christ. Look at verse 3. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Paul is saying that when his readers and us were under age, meaning before we placed our faith in Christ, we were in bondage, we were in slavery to the elemental spiritual forces of the world. What does that mean, right? Well, interpreters differ over what that means. It could just mean the basic principles of spiritual life. For the Jews, that would have been the Mosaic Law. For, for the non-Jews, the Gentiles, that would have been the principles of whatever pagan religion they followed during that day. The enslavement, though, would come uh, under the, because of the false view they had that following these rules, keeping these regulations, would actually bring them salvation. And it wouldn't. It wasn't meant to do that. Paul seems to use the term this way in Colossians chapter 2 as well. But we can't miss that the term can also be applied to demonic spiritual forces. And I think that's what the NIV is trying to bring out here. Because demonic spiritual forces twist truth. They deceive people, especially when it comes to the law. See, I like what John Stott said about this. He said these words. God intended the law to reveal sin and drive men to Christ. Satan uses it to reveal sin and to drive men to despair. God meant the law as an interim step. Remember, we talked about that being temporary. It's an interim step to man's justification, to being declared right with God. Satan uses it as a final step to his condemnation. God meant the law to be a stepping stone to liberty. Satan uses it as a cul-de-sac, deceiving his dupes into supposing that from its fearful bondage, there is no escape. And that's what Satan wants to do, cause us to think there is no way that I can measure up, that I can do all this stuff. There's no way out. I am, I am condemned. I am in prison. I'm in chains. And that's the demonic part of this. And I think there certainly can be a connection between these two views. But, but, but whatever Paul's intended meaning here, it's clear that the spiritual status of everyone, Jews, Gentiles, who he's writing to us today, before we place our faith in Christ, our status is marked by spiritual bondage and slavery and estrangement from a right relationship with God. You're saying, come on, where's the good news of Christmas here? Well, it's coming, I promise you. But we have to do it. We got to get this stuff. We got to get the before picture before we really get the good news. Otherwise, it's not that good. But it is good. And Jesus and God didn't leave us as spiritual slaves. No, God had a plan. He took action. He came near. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. Look at verse four and five. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Two of the most powerful and amazing verses in this entire book, right here. Let's pick it apart. Let's see what he's saying. This gives us a glimpse of the internal plan of God that better leave us in awe. At least that's my goal in helping to bring that out. First, we see his timing, right? When the set time had fully come. 1,300 years of bondage under the law. That's how long it had been. That's how the, the, much long the, the law had been in place until this particular time when God says, I'm sending my son. But I want you to see, everyone, this. Christmas was not an accident. Christmas was not an accident. It wasn't a reaction it wasn't done carelessly on a whim, right? No, it had been carefully and purposefully planned by God. Just like Paul's illustration in verses one and two of the young son not receiving the inheritance right until the time set by his father. So this was the time that the heavenly father had, had, had set when the guardian would be done away with and the heirs would receive the promised inheritance. I want you to think for a minute of the significance of this event in human history. 
Because here's what happened. With the coming of Christ, that becomes the very measure by which we measure time, the time of human history. Think of that. Before Christ came, what do we label it as? B.C., before Christ. After Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. That very event, this very event, according to the, the plan, the eternal plan of God, changed human history and even how we measure our time. That ought to make us in awe of him. But friends, let's apply this a little bit. How many times do we get impatient? How many times do we want God to intervene when we think it's time? Where you at, God? Where you at? This pandemic's been going a long time now. Come on, eight months. Let's get this thing done. I'm sure we've all been there, right? I have, maybe many times. Chapel today is a reminder that God has a plan. He, just like he did in bringing it about Christmas, and he's working out that plan in his timing and in his way, and we can trust him with those details and with his timing. Christmas was God's timing. It was also his, his initiative. Look at verse four again. But when the set time had come, God sent his son. At just the right time, according to his plan, God took action. He entered into our world. Don't miss the wording here because it says God sent his son. That means Jesus didn't begin to exist when he, when he was born in an animal feed box in Bethlehem. In fact, Jesus didn't have a beginning at all. God sent him, meaning Jesus existed before that time, before that event that happened in Bethlehem. He came from somewhere else, and that somewhere else was with God. Jesus, God the Son, second person of the Trinity, fully God. He had no beginning because he was eternal. He just always was. Now, wrap your mind around that for a second. Now, I know I've got a small, finite mind, but I'm telling you what, that's something I don't think any human being, if you really grasp it, he just always was. He was just always there. He wasn't created. He didn't have a beginning, right? Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God, boom, he's just always there. I don't get that. I can't understand that. But it does put me in awe of who he is, his eternality. This is the one, though, whom the Apostle John says was with God in the beginning. This is the one who shared in his glory before the world began. This is the one who was and is equal with God the Father, the very image, the very icon of the invisible God and the exact representation of his being, possessing 100% of the attributes of God. That was and is Jesus. You see, God initiates Christmas not just by sending an angel, not just sending a, a mediator or somebody to announce it. No, he sends his son. God the son steps into our world fully God and yet fully man. And that ought to elicit incredible awe. God the son taking on flesh. Look at verse four again. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. So God the son no beginning, eternal, with the Father before the world began. At a set time, he is born as a human in Bethlehem, in an animal feed box, about 4 BC, in the same way that every other human being enters the world that's out of his mother's womb. And yet, unlike every other human being, he, it was a miraculous birth, wasn't it? Because there was no father that was involved in the conception but don't miss the awe of this. The God of the universe stepped out of the comforts of the eternal joy, the eternal fellowship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And as Paul says in Philippians, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And because he did, friends, he experienced the same pains, the same suffering, the same temptation that each and every one of us go through as human beings. So what does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ gets it. He gets it. He understands our world. He understands what you and I go through. He, he's felt the joy, the hurt, the pain. He's felt all of it. He knows exactly. 
He understands what it's like to, to lose someone that we love. He gets that. He understands injustice. He understands living amongst hard-hearted people that sin in all kinds of ways. He's endured incredible suffering himself because he's lived it. He's been here. He's become one of us human beings. My friends, we don't have a God who just kind of sits in an ivory tower and can't relate to the creatures that he's made. We also don't have a God who's too good or too important to, to just stay in the corner office and, and won't come out on the shop floor and be, be with us human beings. Not at all. Chapel Christmas is about a God who had every right to stay away from here and all the brokenness of living in this sinful, fallen, and broken and messed up world, and yet he chose, he chose at the set time of his eternal plan to enter in, to make himself nothing, to be, as Paul goes on to say, born under the law, born to a Jewish woman and a Jewish nation, subject himself as a human being to the demands of the law as other humans were. And yet, unlike other humans, he perfectly obeyed it. I love this, of Hebrews 4, right? He's been tempted in every way, just as we are, but here is not like us. He didn't sin. Can you imagine? I mean, just try to grasp this just for a second. Imagine you going through a week without sin. Imagine a day without sin, maybe. Not, never an unrighteous thought. Right, a, a word in action. And for an entire lifetime, Jesus, 30-something years, never, ever had anything unrighteous about him. He fulfilled the law perfectly. That just blows me away. And so what all of this means is that Jesus, as fully God, fully man, fully righteous, it means he is uniquely qualified to be our spiritual rescuer, to be the one that rescues us from our spiritual slavery to sin. And as God, he had the power to, to bear our sin and to conquer them. As a righteous human being, he could pay the penalty for our sins. He could step in and be the substitute for us unrighteous human beings. And in fact, that was the purpose of his coming. Look at verse 5 again. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Here we find the real purpose of Christmas. It's not lights. It's not carols. It's not presents. We can enjoy all of those things, but the real purpose of Christmas is right here. It's to redeem enslaved sinners and adopt them into his family. You see, Paul has already written about the spiritual slavery that every single one of us is under before faith in Christ. We saw in verse 3, right, that every one of us, Jews, Gentiles, were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Earlier in chapter 3, he said, everyone who fails to carry out the whole law is under a curse. In fact, verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do what? Everything written in the book of the law. And so this is the problem, right? This is the problem that occasions Christmas Guilty sinners are enslaved to sin, enslaved under the demands of the law that they cannot keep, cursed and powerless to do anything about it. In other words, we humans, we need redemption. We need a redeemer. See, that term redeem, it's a, it's a legal term. It means to buy out. And so God sends his son to redeem, to buy us out of spiritual slavery, to out, of, out of the imprisonment that the demands of the law put us in. And he did that by becoming a curse for us. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Friends, Jesus came into this world for this purpose, so that he could die for us. The righteous one, not under a curse because he perfectly obeyed the law. He stepped in our place. He took our punishment 
He became a curse on our behalf. He substituted his sinless life for us sinful people. He died so that we could live forever with him, that we could be forgiven, that we could be set free from the bondage of the requirements of the law that we could not keep. My friends, the message of Christmas is not go clean yourself up. It's, it's not go try harder. Or I gotta do better as we enter this Christmas season, as we enter this new year. I gotta, I gotta do it on my own and get better. That's not Christmas. The message of Christmas and the awe of Christmas is that I am an enslaved sinner, cursed and condemned before a holy God, but God came to my rescue. That's Christmas. God came to my rescue. He sent his son to save me, to redeem me uh, from my spiritual slavery, to make me righteous. And you know, if you've trusted in Christ as your savior, if you've already done that, this ought to make us more in awe of him. This ought to make us want to live for him and follow him and obey him all the more because of how good and gracious and kind he's been to us. If you don't know Christ as your savior, all of that can be yours through faith in him. This incredible passage in Romans chapter three really captures this whole message. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The Old Testament testifies to this. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, right, are declared righteous freely by his grace, by his undeserved favor. And that comes through the redemption, through the buying out of slavery that was accomplished by Christ. See, that's the gospel message, friends. It's not try harder. It's not do better, be better. It's, it's turn from whatever is keeping you from trusting in Christ. It's all about faith. It's all about believing in him. So let me ask you, are you ready for that? Have you done that? Are you ready to quit trying and start trusting in him? Because that's what Christmas is all about. You know, behind that nativity set, behind that nativity scene that we have and we display in our homes this Christmas season, behind all of that is this. God sent his son into the world to redeem spiritual slaves. But that's not all. Look at the end of verse six or verse five. He also sent him so that we might receive adoption to sonship. I love what one scholar said. He said this, the purpose of the father in sending his son and of the son in condescending to be born of a woman, born under the law, was, what, uh, was that we might not only be delivered from the greatest evil, but might also be crowned with the choicest blessing. I love how he said that. And what could be the greatest blessing? What could be greater than being part of God's family? I want to share with you, this is what jumped out at me in this, in this text and this very little passage right here that just blew me away and really made me to be in awe of God as I studied it and I thought about it because when it says adopted to sonship, that that was the very purpose why Christ came, it's as if in Christmas God is saying, I want you. I want you. I want you to be in my family. That's what he's doing at Christmas. We all want to be wanted, right? From the youngest of kids, even in our teens, into our adult years, we all want to be wanted. We all want to know that we're significant, that we have a purpose, that other people care for us, right? We want to be wanted. And we see so many of us mess up our lives because we go after things that, that, that make us feel wanted, and yet it only temporarily satisfied. But in Christmas, God is saying, I want you, because isn't that what adoption is all about? Adoption is about saying, I want you to be in my family, and I'm gonna go through the process. I'm gonna go through whatever it takes to, to bring you into my family. I'm gonna give you our family name. I'm gonna give you all the rights and privileges of what it means to be a child and, and, and be part of, of our family. And in Paul's day, that would have been inheritance, that when the, uh, when the parents died, they would get the inheritance. That is what God is saying to us at Christmas. 
And how many times do we think just the opposite, right? God doesn't care about me. God couldn't really love me. He hates me. He's against me. He knows all the things that I've done wrong in my life. There's no way God loves me. Or maybe we think, oh, maybe God just sort of, sort of puts up with us. He just sort of tolerates us, or he just kind of puts up with me. Now listen, there's no doubt God hates sin. He calls every single one of us to be holy. He does discipline us when, even as believers, when we continue in our sin. But don't miss the significance of this very passage because in Christmas, God is demonstrating that he cares about every single one of us. In fact, he loves us and that we are so valuable to him that he wants us to be part of his family forever. Man, if that doesn't put us in awe this Christmas, I don't know what does or what can, but that is true. He's adopted us. Be in awe of the eternal plan of God this Christmas, but be in awe that he wants us to be part of his family. Look at verse six. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Friends, not only does God send us his son into the world to make us sons and daughters of him, he sends his spirit to confirm our family status, that we really are in his family. We've now come of age. We are now full heirs. If God was telling us, I want you, if that's what he's communicating and sending his son, when he sends his spirit, he's saying, you are mine. You are my child, son and daughter of me. You are mine. That's what's sending the spirit. That's what he's saying to us. And we don't earn that. We don't earn that by being good. By, by, by doing something, by good deeds. We don't earn that by having some special spiritual uh, experience or some special spiritual qualification. No, God graciously sends his spirit, what does it say, into our hearts. The law was external. That was outside us. The spirit is internal. And he confirms our sonship as we pray, as the Spirit enables us to pray intimately as a child to his heavenly Father in which we can say, Abba, Father. That's an Aramaic term. That's a, a term of great endearment and intimacy and affectionate way to say, Father. The Holy Spirit confirms that we belong to him. And Christmas declares that for the follower of Christ, we are, as Paul concludes right here in verse 7, Here's the summary. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Our privilege to be part of God's family. It's not our doing, it's his. Once again, it says God has made you an heir. God, not you, not me. It's his initiative in bringing that about. It's his grace that allows us to be called sons and daughters of him to receive the spiritual blessings that were promised to Abraham, not our spiritual achievement or our spiritual knowledge. You know, chapel, it's very easy to get lost in the commercial aspects of Christmas, isn't it? It's easy for that. We can certainly enjoy the traditions that go along with the season. I know I do. It is an incredible time of the year. But let's never cease to be amazed at what occasioned Christmas, at what God was doing in sending his son into this world. Let's not get so familiar with the Christmas narrative that we forget that what the real purpose of Christmas is all about. And what is it? To redeem enslaved sinners and to bring us into his family. Let's be in awe of our God who graciously acted not only to free us from spiritual bondage, but who also wanted us and pursued us and made the way by which we could be called his child. That is what Christmas is all about. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. God, it's easy, to, it's easy to get distracted at this time of year, distracted even with good things, Lord, of good times with family and, and, and fun traditions that make the season very joyous. But God, help us to, to never lose sight of or be in awe of, 
of who you are and what you were communicating to us when you, according to your eternal plan, sent your son into this world, showing us that every single one of us are so valuable, not only just to to send Christ into the world, but for him to die for us, for those who don't deserve it. God, would you restore the wonder and the awe of the spiritual significance of Christmas to each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray if there's somebody here watching online, Lord, that that doesn't truly know you as their Savior, who doesn't have the joy of of being forgiven, of, of being part of your family, I pray that today would be the day that they would cry out to you, that they would say something like this, Lord, I am a sinner and I need you. I believe today that Jesus died for me that he rose again from the dead and that by faith I am trusting in him to forgive me and to make me part of your family. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege we have to gather together to be reminded of how great you are and that we are no longer slaves but sons and daughters of you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing as we close. How could we sing any other song this morning than that we are no longer slaves? So let's sing that and mean it with all of our heart this morning. Let's sing.